Welcome to Stream of Conscience, brought to you by Democracy for America, Fairfield County, where we believe that change is possible and you can make it happen. I'm your host, John Hartwell. Our guest today is Doug Sutherland, a member of our Democracy for America group and also a member of our Stream of Conscience production team. Legislatures around the country, including here in Connecticut, are grappling with the need to redraw election district lines following the 2010 census, and deadlocks in the political process often push the problem to the courts to resolve. Last summer, we aired a show on gerrymandering that featured an interview with film director Jeff Reichert and then a segment with Doug, where we talked about the various types of gerrymandering, and Doug is back today to give us an update. Doug, welcome back to Stream of Conscience. Thanks for having me. I think the, the topic of gerrymandering, the more I learn about it, the, the more interesting it is. And, uh, and it's, it's in the news today. There's uh, two court cases right now, Florida and Texas, uh, across the nation. And we're dealing with it in Connecticut as well. So let's talk about uh, Florida. What's going on there? OK, uh, very interesting. Uh, you know, in Florida, they're actually dealing with a court case uh, that in, involves uh, actually the constitutional control of, legis you know, the mandated control of elections by state legislatures. Um, you know, uh, the election clause in the Constitution, which is Article 1, Section 4, uh, says that the states control uh, the manner of uh, holding elections. Um, and, you know, basically, uh, you know, every state does it differently. So um, let's actually just read that. It says the times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof. So that's pretty clear. Right, right. And so every state does it differently. And in most states, it's, it's done specifically by the legislature. A few states have taken it directly out of the hands of the legislature and put it into legislatively appointed uh, commissions of one type or another. Uh, you know, over the years, the courts have entered into this and added a few more restrictions. Uh, each district must be equal in population. Um, and in the, in the Voting Rights Act of 1965, they also added, uh, there must be an equal opportunity for minorities to elect the candidates of their choice. So the equal uh, one man, one vote came from a Supreme Court decision. Okay. And the Voting Rights Act obviously was passed by Congress and, and right. set up the requirements around the, the racial proportions that can be in a district. Right. And so the case in Florida really um, you know, deals with the con constitutional mandate allowing state legislatures to, to control the process. And it turns out that it, back in uh, the, the 90s, uh, up to that point, no uh, minority representative had ever been elected from Florida. Um, and the Republicans apparently joined with minorities in the state and came up with a gerrymandered map that clustered, uh, you know, minorities together into several districts. That's what we call packing. Uh, is one, of the things. one of those districts, if I remember correctly, has sort of a, a knob on the west coast and a knob on the east kind coast. Kind of a barbell shape. That's to, right. And right. it's and it's held together by literally a road going going across the middle of the state. Right. So it's a very strange looking uh, district. But what it did do was it allowed uh, several minority representatives to be elected for the first time in Florida. So you might look at that and say, well, that's a good thing. Um, it also allowed the Republicans to consolidate control of all the other districts. So they basically clustered minorities into you know, a few districts, and now they control the rest of the, the state. And that allowed them to take control of what was traditionally a democratically controlled legislature. So I think one of the things that we have to understand is that there's no free lunch. That's, that's right. There's, you know, if you look at this, you know, years ago I used to think, that there was a perfect way to have a computer program somehow do districts. Every way of doing it has its problems. You disenfranchise somebody. Um, and, and the term gerrymandering really kind of is more talking about how politicians use it to manipulate, uh, and usually for short-term gain. So, so. in Florida, the, the court case is now challenging what? Well, it, so they, they did this clustering. They got minority representation back in the 90s. Um, and apparently that did not please some people. Um, and so, and, and the fact that this was a very odd shaped district is what they kind of pounced on. And they passed a, uh, an amendment to the state constitution in 2010, basically saying that all districts had to be compact. 
Compact. Right. So they, they had to not have these odd shapes. I don't know the exact definition of compact, but um, you know, basically they should you know, be you know, somewhat you know, not so disconnected. Right. You know? and, and generally, I think the suggestion is that they follow county lines and city lines and other lines that are already drawn. Okay. And okay. what's the problem with that? Well, you know, the, the people that liked the, the uh, gerrymandered districts that allowed minorities to rise up, they, they're now saying, no, this takes away control of the election process from the state legislature, and that is, is called for in the Constitution. And so where is this case now? Well, right, right now that case is in uh, a federal district court. Um, and so they're, I think just this week, they're starting to hear arguments on that. And that, it has wide implications, however, because if the court decides that that amendment you know, restricted the state legislature and that that's unconstitutional, this would affect other states uh, that have taken it directly out of the hands of the legislature. Uh, on our first uh, show and in the gerrymandering movie, we talked a lot about the California uh, Proposition 11 and then Proposition 20, which basically created a commission to do redistricting, to take it out of the hands of the state legislature right, in California. a nonpartisan commission. A nonpartisan commission is a very complicated formula for putting that commission together. But if, if the court throws out this amendment in Florida and says that the state legislatures cannot be restricted in their control of this process, then uh, that, that whole proposition could be thrown out. So this is very interesting because the Constitution in Florida, according to the way the voters of the state have now uh, enacted this amendment, said it must, they must have compact districts, which would get rid of this gerrymandering that we had before. But it's possible that this has tied the hands, unconstitutionally tied right. the hands of the state legislature to do what they wanted to do. Right. Uh, and we'll see how that works out in federal court. Right. And if they've tied the hands of the state legislature or if, if the court finds that taking it out of the legislature and putting it into a commission is not allowed, then we could upset the apple cart all over the country because there's lots of other places where the, the, the uh, actual drawing of lines is not done. That's in, right. And I, I think most, you know, uh, you know, observers would think that a, an independent commission is the better way to do it. You know, and so you, you would think so, but right. but maybe not. Maybe not. Yeah. What's happening in Texas? Okay, in, in Texas, it deals with the uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, um, which uh, you know basically calls for um, you know not drawing lines to minimize uh, the the representation of minorities, um, and also in the case of Southern states, it required Southern states to get pre-approval of their districts from a, the, from the Justice Department or a federal court because of their history of discriminating against minorities. Right, so, and this happened at the height of the Civil Rights Movement. There'd been the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and then the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and, and this was, was the, the tool that the federal government used to force the southern states, where segregation and voter discrimination had been rampant, to stop doing that and to draw lines fairly and also to protect the right of people to actually go in and vote. Right. And one of those things was that when you draw the lines before they go into effect, you southern states that had this history of discrimination, you have to get pre-approval before it can go into effect. Right. What's happening today? Okay, well, you know, Texas is going to pick up four congressional seats as a result of their being the state that grew the most of any state in the country. They, okay. they added about 4.3 million people. Wow. Um, and about 65% of those uh, were Hispanics. Ah. Okay. And so the state legislature got together and redrew lines, and the Republicans are controlling the state legislature, um, fearing that they would lose some control by all those minorities coming into the state. They apparently, you know, drew the lines to dilute, you know, uh, you know the, the minority influence. And so when they went for pre-approval on this, uh, the, the, uh, I think it was a state dis or a federal district court looked at it and said, no, you have used minority influence here to, to gerrymander. Um, of course, there were a lot of minority groups that were bringing this to the attention of the court. So uh, you know, it, it turns out that uh, in the meantime, they, they needed districts. They have elections coming up. And so uh, some groups asked the, uh, a, a federal district court to look at this and maybe draw some lines uh, in the meantime. So they looked at it and they drew up some radically different um, 
lines. I think they redrew about 128 out of the 130 districts in Texas. So now the Republicans are saying, oh, you, you went way overboard um, and you radically changed the map. And so we're going to take this to the Supreme Court. And the, the pre-approval under the Voting Rights Act is actually done by the Justice Department. I think it's a Justice Department or a, dis, uh, or a court in, uh, maybe in Washington. Right. right. Yeah. And then, but the, so while we're waiting for the Justice Department and the court in Washington to rule and give pre-approval, the local federal, federal court, district court. Yes. has drawn the lines right. which seem to favor Democrats, whereas the original plan favored Republicans. And it's all now in the Supreme Court. Right. right. And the timing of all of this is very important because in Texas, they need to know where the lines are drawn by the 1st of February in order to get ready for some elections coming up in April. Right. But the, the court in, in Washington, not the Supreme Court, but the people who are supposed to be doing the pre-approval, right. won't have their decision ready until middle of February. Right. So there's, right. A, there's a problem there. And this is a real problem because people, to, in order to have elections, you have to have districts. You have to have registrars who know who's, who's in it's, the district and who isn't. They yeah. have to provide, prepare the voting lists, all of that sort of this stuff. This is not, not an academic exercise. This is not it's, academic yes. and this is not no. trivial. No. And there's a lot no. of power uh, that's going to be distributed one way or the other. Right. And it's going to stay that way for the next 10 years. That's right. This, this sticks for 10 years. So we talked before about four kinds of scenarios for gerrymandering. And I'd like to review those very quickly because I'm sure... Uh, if people had to take a quiz, they wouldn't be able right. to remember. So, right. what are they? Uh, what is? Um, what, where did gerrymandering come from? Very quickly. Okay. Well, the original, the name gerrymandering comes from uh, a redistricting that happened uh, in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, that was in 1812. So um, this has been around a long time. This has been time. around a long time. Okay. And I understand it actually. Some of it started even before that. Okay. Um, but there was a uh, a governor, uh, Elbridge Gerry. It actually should be Gerry. Uh, Gerry. Ed right. Eldridge Gerry. Right. It actually should be gerrymandering. Right. Um, he was he reluctantly signed into law a redistricting plan that was a very strange uh, shape, and so some cartoonist uh, you know n you know tagged it with the name uh, gerrymandering, or now it's called gerrymandering. Right. So that's it goes way back. And there are four basic techniques. Right. First one is packing, which is what happened in Florida back in the 90s, where basically you take some group, you know, mm -hmm. in, their, in their case it was a group of minorities, and pack them into one district. You give them their representative. But now if, if there's fewer of those people in the other districts, then the representatives in those districts don't need to concern themselves with the minority issues. Right. Okay. And uh, the next one, the opposite of packing is? Cracking. 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 What is cracking? Well, cracking is where you have, you know, say you take a group of minorities and you divide them up and put them all into different districts, and now they have no chance of, of having a representative of their own. Okay. So. And uh, next is hijacking. Hijacking is an interesting thing where, you know, say you have a representative that, that you really would like to get rid of, and, uh, you know, he's been a thorn in the side of your party, and if your party controls the process, you can draw the line so that it goes around his house. And now he's suddenly in a different district. And so all the work that he did in the last election cycle to get elected, to building up uh, relationships and putting in the shoe leather to go around neighborhoods, that all goes out the window and he has to start over with a whole new set of constituents. And so, the last one is called kidnapping. The last one is kidnapping where basically um, you, you put two opponents in the same district. And so you know that for sure after you've done that, that one of those representatives is going away because they both live in the same right. district. That actually happened here in Connecticut 10 years ago when we had to go from six congressional districts down to five because we hadn't grown as fast as some other, er other areas of the country, so right. we lost a, con a congressman 10 years right. ago. And at that time, before that, we had three Republicans and three Democrats, and they had to put, they, they made a decision to put one Democrat and one Republican in the same district and let them fight it out. Right. And so actually, in that case, it was a fairly bipartisan you know, it was thing definitely they, bipartisan. It was bipartisan, and it was a fair way to do it. Right. You know, so, uh, you know, more typically, a more typical partisan gerrymandering would put two Republicans in the same district or, or two Democrats, and so one right. of them gets eliminated. But so. here in Connecticut, we have a process that's set up uh, quite differently from other states because even though 
the Democrats control the state legislature by healthy margins in both the House and the Senate. Right. And we also now have a governor who is a Democrat. So you'd say, well, hey, they can run the table. But they right. can't because the final deal has to be approved in the legislature by two-thirds majorities in both houses. And the Democrats don't have a two-thirds majority in either house. And mm -hmm. so the Republicans can effectively block it. Right. And we have a district, a, a redistricting commission that starts off with four Democrats and four Republicans. And 10 years ago, when they had a very difficult problem to, to overcome, the, the loss of a seat and who was going to get put together, who was going to get kidnapped and forced into a runoff, this year we didn't have that problem, and yet we don't have an agreement on the congressional map. Can you tell me about that? Right. Um, well, it, it seems like uh, you know, the, the Republicans, uh, feeling like they really didn't have anything to lose, decided uh, you know, to go for a radical change in the district map. Um, and what they decided to do was basically a, a packing type of gerrymandering, uh, where they were going to take uh, you know, minorities, basically a minority district or a district that has a lot of minorities in the Bridgeport area, and move that into the district with New Haven. So they were going to move Bridgeport from the 4th Congressional District into uh, the 3rd Congressional District. Um, and they claim that that's to help minorities, that they would have a better chance of electing their representative. But in reality, I think uh, it, what it would do is it would make the 4th District a very safe district for Republicans. Um, and it wouldn't add any representation in the 3rd District because the 3rd District already has you know, minority representation. Right. So the Republicans said that they were going to create a majority-minority district, meaning right. that the, the district would have so many minorities that it would be likely to elect a minority right. uh, at the next election, or, or at least when the current congresswoman stands down, Rosa DeLauro. So they were going to take a bunch of Democratic voters from Bridgeport, put them in a district that's already Democratic, and say, okay, that's your district, not, not a problem, right. uh, see you later, and thereby tip the balance in the 4th Congressional District back to the Republicans. Right. Now, what is the history of the 4th District? Uh, the 4th District has, has been a very competitive district. I mean, for the previous to Jim Himes winning it for the Democrats, uh, it was held for, I think, 21 years by a Republican. The, the races were always close, but it's, it's been held by Republicans you know, for most of that period. Um, by moving Bridgeport into the third district, um, it would become a very safe district for Republicans. And, and the fourth district would not get more competitive because right now it's, it's a Democratic district already. And so here in the state, the, the redistricting commission was supposed to have finished the congressional map by the 21st of December. Right. They'd, given, they'd been given extra time by the court. They should have finished it actually right, back November in 30th. September. Well, September oh, 15th okay. to begin yeah. with, but you know, nobody knew that. Everybody knew they weren't going to make that one. Right. But it, the final deadline, drop dead, can't go any further, was the 21st of December, and the redistricting commission actually did not come up with any uh, bipartisan plan. And in fact, the very last day, the Republicans took off the table moving Bridgeport out of the fourth and into the third and instead decided to look at New Britain which is in the fifth and try to move that into the first to get the same effect to create right. a safe district in the fifth which is up in Litchfield County. Right. The Democrats said no and so now it's went to the Supreme Court and what did the Supreme Court do? The Supreme uh, Court of the state of Connecticut not right. the Supreme Court in Washington. Right. Well the, the Supreme Court uh, of Connecticut first tried to get the redistricting commission to do their job. Do their job. They, they right. basically are saying they'll try, but they don't really expect to. Right. Um, and so they appointed a special master. Yes. Okay. Um, and the special master is going to do what? Um, I mean, he's going to try to resolve it. I mean, it, it's up to him now. I think he has the power to, to make the final map. So he has the power, but the, the, he, the Supreme Court actually gave him some guidelines. And okay. the guidelines were start with a current map and only make the changes absolutely necessary based on population to smooth out the districts. And in fact, the changes required are minor. Right. The second congressional district, which is in eastern Connecticut, you know, uh, Groton and Clinton and, you know, all, the eastern side of the state, needs to lose 
15,000 voters. So those have to be allocated to the other four districts mm -hmm. somehow in order, and, and it's not a big change. Right. So the special master has held a hearing. Uh, they've had submissions of plans by the two parties and by other interested, interested parties. Uh, I'm a party of that suit. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's got to come back with his decision, I think by the 7th of February, and the court will make its decision by the 15th of February, right. and it'll basically be a done deal. Right. So uh, I think in Connecticut what we can s we'll see going forward is a very small change right. uh, to, the, to the current districts. But, um, you know, the, the Republicans certainly did try to make, make a much larger change. Right, right. I mean, you know, the special master knows that if he makes anything too radical, it will be challenged in court. So that's, that's always kind of looming over them is that they have to do something that, that won't cause a challenge and, and delay things even further. Right. So, yeah. Well, um, this is, this is the pivotal year, of course, because we have the, the election coming up with the president. That won't change based on redistricting, right. but the Congress will certainly change based on redistricting. State legislatures will change, and, and all across the country, gerrymandering is, uh, you know, the name of the game. Right. So uh, we'll keep watching this, uh, see what happens here in Connecticut. I think changes are going to be minor uh, in the congressional districts. Uh, they've made changes at the state district level. We can talk about that in another time. Right. We'll see how Florida and Texas see how come Florida out. Florida and Texas come out. Uh, yeah. It's going to be a crazy year. Yeah. Doug, thanks very much for coming thanks in. Thanks for having me. And now, a stream of conscience commentary with Elsa Peterson Obachowski. If I have $20 in my wallet and someone standing next to me has $20,000, does that person have a thousand times more right than I have to speak and be heard? What if they have twenty million dollars? Does that give them even more right to free speech? Well, according to the United States Supreme Court, it does. January 21st, 2012 marks the second anniversary of the Supreme Court decision known as Citizens United. In the words of the Supreme Court, this decision holds that political spending is a form of protected speech under the First Amendment, and the government may not keep corporations or unions from spending money to support or denounce individual candidates in elections. While corporations or unions may not give money directly to campaigns, they may seek to persuade the voting public through other means, including ads. Republicans and Democrats alike are horrified at this decision. It is one of the worst in the history of our country, according to Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders. Senators John McCain and Russ Feingold have called it a disappointment and a terrible mistake, while Senator Olympia Snow called it a serious disservice to our country. The nonpartisan advocacy group Common Cause says it has turned our elections into auctions where power and position can be sold to the highest bidder. President Obama concluded, I can't think of anything more devastating to the public interest. But the First Amendment guarantee of free speech is one of our most treasured civil liberties as Americans. So what's wrong with guaranteeing free speech to corporations? The objections boil down to two points. The first point of objection is that, according to any reasonable definition of the word person, corporations are not people. The Bill of Rights was written to protect the civil rights and liberties of human beings, not of non-person entities. The legal notion that corporations can be considered people comes from an arcane judicial note in an 1886 case involving the Southern Pacific Railroad's refusal to pay some of its taxes, a case that the railroad won, by the way. The second point of objection is that money is not speech, or at least money shouldn't be speech. The First Amendment guarantees freedom of speech and of the press. It does not say anything about money. By equating corporate money with speech and allowing corporate money to be used for ads, the Supreme Court has empowered multi-million dollar corporations to dominate our electoral process by drowning out the voices of ordinary working people like you and me and of candidates that represent our interests. And it has allowed corporations to form a new kind of political action committee, the Super PAC, 
Super PACs can raise unlimited amounts of money without having to disclose who their members are or where they get their donations. So the folks with the $20 million wallets not only get to speak a million times louder, they get to hide their identity. In an era when running for Congress, even in a modest House district, can cost well over a million dollars, and the average Senate campaign costs more than seven million dollars, the influence of corporate money can't be overemphasized. When a single TV ad can run upwards of $100,000, a candidate targeted by corporate attack ads doesn't stand a chance. Money may not be able to buy votes outright, but it sure can buy a whole lot of ads to influence voters' decisions. What can we do to cure the effects of this ill-considered decision? A number of bills and constitutional amendments have been proposed to counteract Citizens United. At this early stage, it's not easy to know which proposals would be most effective, which have the most chance of being enacted, or what new guises the role of money in politics will take. But one thing I'm sure of, I'm going to learn more and stay involved, and I hope you will too, because the fundamental American democratic principle of one person, one vote, is at stake. This has been a Stream of Conscience commentary. I'm Elsa Peterson Obachowski. Thanks for watching. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. If you're interested in learning more about progressive political action in Fairfield County, please check out our Democracy for America group. We meet the first Wednesday of the month, 7 to 9 p.m., at the Silver Star Diner in Norwalk. And we always welcome new members. Remember, change is possible, and you can make it happen. This has been Stream of Conscience, and I'm your host, John Hartwell. We hope to see you again soon.